Today is March 1st, 2023. I want to talk about the situation in and around Ukraine. I want to apologize for missing a video on Monday. There was a family medical emergency. Uh, it, it turns out it wasn't as as serious as it seemed at first. So that, that is the good news. The bad news is I, I missed Monday. I'm back on schedule with my midweek video. Now let's get started with the situation in Ukraine. Looking at liveuamap.com, you can see the encirclement of Bakhmut continuing. Uh, even Western media outlets are beginning to admit how bleak things actually are in Bakhmut. And there are some pretty bleak headlines coming from out of the, the Western media. I've included a link to a video done recently by Alexander Bikuris of the Duran. He's been going over the situation in Bakhmut in detail, including the, the Western media's changing tune regarding how everything is going there. Uh, we're also hearing about these drone strikes uh, in Russia, different types of drone strikes and, and uh, acts of sabotage. Again, these are very symbolic. They're not, a lot of them are not even causing damage to critical facilities. And even if they did, it's not being done uh, on the scale or often enough to, to have the sort of impact that, say, Russia's missile and drone campaigns are having on Ukraine's infrastructure. Now, while it's important to keep track of everything that's unfolding on the battlefield uh, in Ukraine right now at this moment, we're at a very critical stage. I think it's really important to take a look at how uh, senior Western officials are looking at this conflict one year in. I mean, we're, we're a little bit past the one year mark now. And specifically, I'm talking about an audio only podcast by War on the Rocks. It was titled Backing Ukraine Against Russia with Colin Call and Derek Cholette. And this is Under Secretary of Defense for Policy Colin Call and Counselor uh, to the Secretary of State Derek Cholette. Uh, and they're talking about the special military operation one year in. And it's very interesting because these are two men who are involved in decision making. And it's very interesting to see how they talk about the special military operation to, uh, to someone who is not really part of the mainstream Western media. It's more of this, this niche uh, kind of beltway uh, program that, that policy wonks are tuning in to listen to and, and contributing to. It's not mainstream media that the general public would be consuming. So it's very interesting. And uh, it's hard to tell who's talking when because it is audio only. Uh, but one of them says, if you look back a year, the Ukrainians are in a much better position than I think a lot of people anticipated at the beginning of the conflict. And then they start talking about all of these myths. They start going through all of the myths uh, that we've heard so many times about how... Uh, Russia would uh, roll over Ukrainian troops in just a few days. Uh, and because they were unable to, that, that shows us that Russia has already lost this conflict because their initial goal to overtake all of Ukraine in just a matter of days, that, that was a failure. Uh, they give you the impression that Russia wasn't prepared for this to last a long time. But as I've pointed out many times before, even the Pentagon during press briefings would remind the media that Russia has actually accumulated a huge amount of men, uh, equipment, munitions for this operation. They were fully prepared for this to be protracted, large scale and intense. And we can see that Russia is still going at this point while the collective West is having a hard time supplying uh, the Ukrainian military with the, bare, the very bare necessities. And I'm going to get into that here in just a moment because that is something that they do eventually get around to addressing. So when they begin their conversation about the special military operation one year in and they have to kind of retreat into deception or delusion, that, that is a very bad sign for Ukraine. It's a bad sign for Ukraine and their Western sponsors, uh, Washington in particular. 
the getting back to this point where they claim Russia has already lost because Putin thought he would conquer the, the whole country, and now he's not going to be able to do that. At best, he'll only be able to secure the Donbas region. I want to go back to Russian President Vladimir Putin's original speech when the special military operation began in February, late February last year. This is from Bloomberg. It's titled Transcript Vladimir Putin's Televised Address on Ukraine. This is what he says. The purpose of this operation is to protect the people who for eight years now have been facing humiliation and genocide perpetrated by the Kiev regime. To this end, we will seek to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine, as well as bring to trial those who perpetrated numerous bloody crimes against civilians, including against citizens of the Russian Federation. It's not our plan to occupy Ukrainian territory. They, 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 the Russian government, the Russian president literally said the exact opposite. It is not their intention to occupy all of Ukraine. They want to secure the Donbas region. They want to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. And who can deny at this point that that is not happening in Ukraine right now? As a matter of fact, uh, Colin Kahl and Derek Chalette, they're going to admit that that is exactly what's happening. Ukraine is being demilitarized. The West is also being demilitarized. Then they go on and they say Russia imagined it would emerge a stronger power within a multipolar world and instead they will emerge a shattered power. And they're talking about uh, Russian military power specifically being shattered. It's military destroyed. They talk about how 97% of the, the Russian military is in Ukraine right now, which, which is obviously not true. Uh, even the, the West's own reports about uh, the Russian military and where it is uh, betrays this, this more recent claim that they've been making of 97% of the military being in Ukraine. As a matter of fact, Russian military industrial output is growing, it's increasing, it already is larger than the West, and it's getting larger. It's not Russia that is out of artillery shells, it is the United States and its allies, and, and more specifically Ukraine. Uh, and it's not Russia that is out of main battle tanks, it is Ukraine that is out of tanks. They're out of tanks and now they're uh, being pledged Western main battle tanks that they, they don't know how to operate, they don't know how to sustain on the battlefield. And this is being done specifically because Ukraine is out of tanks that they actually could use effectively, or I would say more effectively than Western main battle tanks. Then they, they kind of admit though, uh, later on they talk about uh, artillery shell produ production in the West was geared toward these small wars that the West was fighting all around the world in, in the Middle East and Northern Africa and Central Asia. They never imagined that they would ever have their artillery units firing at the rate that Ukraine is right now with, with Western artillery pieces and Western artillery ammunition. They never imagined that and their industry simply wasn't up to sustaining that type of warfare and it will take them years to gear up to where they will be able to sustain that. And that's just simply too long for Ukraine. Then they talk about how the coalition, the coalition that the US is leading against Russia, how it's much stronger than people imagined that it would be. Not, I, I really don't think so. And what are the features they claim was this, this really positive outcome where they're dismantling Europe's dependency on uh, Russia for energy and it says Russia will no longer be the principal energy supplier in Europe and that's another reason this has been a strategic failure for Russia and the geopolitical consequences of that will be profound but but actually back in reality Europe is still getting Russian energy they're just buying it from India Russia is instead of selling it to Europe they're selling it to India and then India is reselling it back to Europe and it's not me claiming that. That's a, this is the Western media claiming this. So look at this article from The Guardian. British media concerns grow that India is backdoor into Europe for Russian oil. And it says industry sources said tracking shipments of Russian oil to Europe via India is proving very difficult. You'll find that several shipments accrued will arrive at port from different countries 
and then they're blended together. Tracking a hydrocarbon is basically impossible. There are several tactics shippers are using to hide the origin of Russian oil, sources said financially paying in Chinese currency rather than the industry standard dollar is an option. Uh, yuan ruble trading volumes have surged 1,067% since February's invasion of Ukraine. Transfers of oil cargoes from ship to ship have also spiked, suggesting oil is being switched from Russian flag vessels to other ships. Increasing numbers of vessels have been going dark by switching off their uh, uh, automotive identification systems as thousands of gallons of the black stuff are transferred on the waves. So this claim that Europe is no longer dependent on Russian energy is simply untrue. And then even if somehow the U.S. manages to uh, stop all Russian oil, all Russian energy of all kinds from flowing to Europe, where is, where is Europe going to get its energy from? It's going to get it from, say, the United States. It will always be much more expensive for Europe to get it from the United States than it was to get it from Russia. There's no way the U.S. can compete in terms of uh, uh, pricing because they have to liquefy it and ship it across the ocean whereas Russia was just pumping it into pre-existing pipelines. Europe will always be at a disadvantage as long as it's shut off from cheap Russian energy. And then it's not as if Russia isn't somehow able to sell this energy elsewhere. They are. They most certainly are selling it elsewhere. They will just simply sell it to India, to China, and the rest of the developing or newly industrialized world. And it will give them a competitive edge industrially against Europe and even the United States. So this, does that sound like that is a, a negative outcome for Russia and its allies or a negative outcome for the West? Again, this is uh, a, a senior official from the Department of Defense and a senior official from the uh, State Department retreating into, into desperate delusion and deceit to try to cover up how badly things are going in their proxy war against Russia and Ukraine. Look at this from the BBC, Ukraine crisis. Who is buying Russian oil and gas? It says India and China have become the largest buyers of Russian oil as Western nations restrict purchases and impose sanctions. So who's, who's hurting here. Is it, is it really Russia? Russia is still able to sell their energy elsewhere, so they're not the ones hurting. Is it uh, the rest of Eurasia? No, they're getting a steady supply of cheap energy, a guaranteed steady supply since Europe doesn't, doesn't want it. And then where is Europe going to get cheap energy from? The answer is absolutely nowhere. And then they talk about one year on, Western public support is so strong for the, this proxy war against Russia and Ukraine. And what is their evidence? Their evidence is uh, they were traveling from California to Texas and they saw some Ukrainian flag bumper stickers or, or Ukrainian flags waving in someone's front yard. Uh, but again, back in reality, when we actually look for real evidence, of, of what Western support actually looks like for this proxy war. Uh, this is from Pew, Pew Research. What public opinion surveys found in the first year of the war in Ukraine. So this is a Western polling agency. This is, again, none of this is from the Russian media or Chinese media. This is all from the West. 43% strongly or somewhat approved of the administration's response to the invasion, while 34% strongly or somewhat disapproved. Around one in five adults, 22% were not sure. So not even half of Americans support what, what is going on in Ukraine. So if 50, not even 50% of your population supports what is going on in, in Ukraine, what the United States is doing in Ukraine, that, that actually is not strong public support. That is very poor public support, especially if you, you claim that uh, the U.S. is some sort of democratic society. And again, this is the U.S. Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, Colin Call, and counselor to the Secretary of State, Derek Chollette, determining Western public support for their proxy war in Ukraine by looking at uh, bumper stickers and flags in people's front front yards. It's, it's delusional. It really is. Then they talk about the, uh, this myth of Ukraine, you know, the U.S. giving all this support to Ukraine and then winning, winning the battle for Kiev. And again, uh, when you look at the correlation of forces, Russia never had enough troops to make a serious attempt to take uh, Kiev by force, very obviously. 
Uh, and I've talked about this many times before, and their need to try to depict that as some sort of resounding victory. Again, it is them retreating into delusion. I think you can see what, what the theme of this, this one-year anniversary look at the conflict is. It is delusional. Then they talk about uh, their efforts to maintain Ukrainian forces uh, fighting, maintaining their Soviet air, air defenses. They're, they're trying to explain why, because uh, the host of this interview constantly asks why the U.S. isn't doing more. Why, why isn't Ukraine getting everything that they ask for? And they talk about how the most important things are uh, air defense, artillery, and now armor. And they're talking about this process of trying to uh, sustain their Soviet era air defense systems. And that is a process that we, we now see has completely run its course. Uh, they've gone through all of that. It's entirely exhausted. And now they're sending inadequate amounts of inferior Western air defense systems that Ukraine has really no ability to use effectively or as effectively as their Soviet era systems. And of course, we remember articles like this. This is from late last year from CNBC, Ukraine in danger of running out of air defenses as Russia launches relentless drone attacks. If Ukrainian SAMs, surface-to-air missile systems, are not resupplied with ammunition and ultimately augmented and replaced with Western equivalents over time, Russian aerospace forces will regain the ability to pose a major threat, analysts say. Uh, so again, I'm not, I'm not citing Kremlin sources. I'm citing... The, the Western media, the U.S. media, uh, they're the ones saying this, and they are referring to statements out of the Pentagon and also analysts who work with or for the Pentagon. Then they start sort of bragging about how unprecedented all of this support is for Ukraine. The, the amount of money that they have transferred over to Ukraine in a single year is unprecedented. Also, the the scale and the speed of the sanctions are also unprecedented. But then uh, when you see them bragging about this, but then you look at it one year on and you see, well, it's not really working very well. What is this? Again, this is them retreating into delusion. Uh, they talk about the sanctions, how they were prepared ahead of time and that they were supposed to be a deterrent against Russia from uh, beginning the special military operation. And that clearly didn't work. And then since since the special military operation began, these sanctions have utterly failed, and even admittedly so across the West. They have failed to hinder uh, Russia's ability to continue carrying out the special military operation. And then they admit that the sanctions have actually hit, hit the West pretty hard in terms of the, the price of energy, obviously, especially for Europe, and also uh, prices for everything else because everything else is going to be impacted by the price of energy and that includes the price of food even then then the host of the interview ryan evans he he asks them both you know why what else can we do because the sanctions don't really seem to be working what else can we do and their answer is well we just have to wait eventually the sanctions will will work and this is something that they have been saying all along and if uh if you've been following the Duran, and I highly recommend that you do, they have been talking about this for months and months, the entire year, really. And they said, uh, bef before the summer even, they said that a lot of these U.S. and European officials kept claiming that, oh, just wait until June, June of last year, wait until June, and uh, that's when the Russian economy will finally collapse. And of course it hasn't. And of course it's not going to. It's not going to collapse by June this year either. And so, again, this retreat into delusion. They also admit that Russia is circumventing the sanctions already in many ways. And I, if they're already doing that, what makes them think they're not going to find many more ways to do this? Uh, and again, that's not me saying that. This is from the New York Times. Russia sidesteps Western punishments with help from friends. And the article says, most container ships have stopped ferrying goods like phones, washing machines, and car parts into the port of St. Petersburg. Instead, such products are being carried on trucks or trains from Belarus, China, and Kazakhstan. FESCO, the Russian transport operator, has added new ships and new ports of call to a route uh, with Turkey that transports Russian industrial goods and foreign appliances and electronics between uh, Novorosk and Istanbul. This, this game of Western sanctions may have, may have worked to a certain extent when the West 
monopolized and dominated industry worldwide, but they can't do it anymore because the, the technology and the power that stems from industrialization has been more evenly distributed worldwide, including uh, too many nations that are uh, supporting Russia economically. Then the host asks uh, these these two U.S. representatives or officials, they ask them, you know, why, why isn't the West providing more military assistance to Ukraine? Why isn't it being done faster? And the answer uh, they give comes down to the amount of money they're able to get. They're only able to get a certain amount of money for each tranche. And then they have to do this triage process of determining what Ukraine needs more right now. What do they need more of right now versus things that Ukraine wants but doesn't necessarily need as, as badly? And that's how they determine what Ukraine gets. Uh, and then they give the example of the Patriot missile system. They say one Patriot missile battery costs a billion dollars. The, in the interceptors are extraordinarily expensive. So if they gave the Patriot missile batteries to Ukraine when they, they asked for it, they wouldn't have had any money for anything else like uh, anti-tank missiles or artillery shells or armored vehicles or any of these other things that Ukraine absolutely essentially needs to keep this proxy war going. So again, it is a triage process. What do they need most now versus what they want or, or what else they need but not as much? And it becomes a, a choice between air defense, tanks, armored personnel carriers, infantry fighting vehicles, artillery, uh, military aviation, which of these can the U.S. afford to send now versus what, what they might be able to send later down the road. And the, the reality is, while these two uh, high-level officials are saying uh, what Ukraine needs most is air defense, artillery, and mechanized armor, in reality, Ukraine needs all of these things. They need all of these things all at the same time. They need armor, artillery, air defense. They also need military aviation. They need all of it in much larger quantities than the West is even capable of providing piecemeal, let alone all at the same time. And the reason why is because Russia most certainly has all of this at the same time at their disposal and in vast quantities. And then they start talking about uh, F-16s and other NATO warplanes specifically. They talk about how it's impossible to come up with the money for this and also continue the flow of everything else that Ukraine constantly needs just to perpetuate this, this proxy war, uh, just to continue losing at the rate Ukraine is losing right now, uh, saying nothing of giving them enough to actually turn the tide. And that's what they eventually more or less are admitting, that this is about stretching it out for as long as possible. And they admit at the end of the day, it's not about Ukraine winning against Russia, it's about giving them the best possible bargaining position uh, when negotiations finally do begin. So everything the U.S. is doing is about killing as many Ukrainians as possible, uh, also killing as many Russians as possible, creating as big of a mess as possible, and raising the price for a Russian victory as high as possible before ultimately this is all going to end with negotiations and Ukraine's loss anyway. And if you listen to this whole podcast, that is exactly what they're saying. Even if they don't say it directly, read between the lines. That is exactly what they're saying. Uh, and then they start talking about all of these, these countries helping Russia, countries like India and China. And they complain about how, how India uh, relies too much on Russia for its military, its, its modern military capabilities. A lot of their weapon systems are joint produced with Russia um, or, or bought from Russia. And they're claiming that the U.S. is a better alternative. And they claim Russia is going to be rebuilding its, its military power for a decade to come. And that uh, sooner or later, India is going to realize that their military future does not rest with Russia. And then that's they're saying this before they start talking about the, the actual state of the West military industrial capacity and how it'll take years just to get up to a level to sustain, again, to sustain Ukraine's current rate of loss, not, not match what Russia is, is bringing to the battlefield or exceeding it, just to help them maintain the current level they are losing at. That will take years for the U.S. and its allies to reach. So where, where are they going to have, they're, they're claiming that Russia isn't going to have any extra military industrial output to spare 
to, to resupply a country like India. What about the United States? And, and again, this isn't me this isn't me talking about this. This is, again, the Western media. This is from the Wall Street Journal. U.S. effort to arm Taiwan faces new challenge with Ukraine conflict. Flow of weapons to Kiev taxes an already stretched U.S. defense industrial base. And does, does that sound like the U.S. is ready to step in and supply India with all of its military needs versus Russia? Again, this is completely delusional. And I'm pretty sure that uh, India is is wise to this because they're talking about their alliance management with India and how they have to be patient with India because India is so important. Why is India so important? Because the U.S. really sees them as an ally? No, because they want to use India as a battering ram against China, just like they're using Europe and Ukraine as a battering ram against Russia. And I'm pretty sure India is wise to all of this. And uh, I'm also sure that India realizes that if the United States will not tolerate a strong, independent Russia or China, or even a strong and independent Europe, including Germany, to the extent that they will blow up pipelines to, to prevent them from becoming strong and independent. Surely they're not going to tolerate a strong and independent India. I, mean, I think India is, is fully aware of this. I don't think they're anywhere near naive enough to believe otherwise. Uh, then they talk about jo uh, U.S. President Joe Biden's recent visit to Kiev. And uh, they talk about how dangerous this was. It was extremely risky because this is a war zone the U.S. doesn't control like like it has in previous uh, wars of aggression and proxy wars that the, that the West has waged. Uh, they talk about all of this risk and they try to make it out as if, uh, well, Russia didn't attack President Biden because there's this sense of deterrence. If, if they did, the, the consequences would be huge. But actually, they, they contacted Russia and more or less asked Russia's uh, okay if if Biden could go because if not uh, and Russia decided or or there was even a possibility that Russia would attack then President Biden wouldn't have made the trip so there were assurances that nothing would happen and that's why the trip took place and I've already kind of gone over how President Biden went there to give assurances rhetorically only because there was no pledge of actual uh, material support for Ukraine um, b besides the dwindling amount that has been uh, rolled out month to month as this drags on. And, and then they get into all of these other myths. They claim that it was Ukraine's idea to launch the Kherson and Kharkov offensives, and they simply went to the U.S. and, and other NATO nations to help them crunch the numbers, because apparently a correlation of forces is uh, a fundamental skill set that for some reason Ukraine doesn't possess at this moment. Uh, they also talk about uh, the nature of uh, Russia's advance on the battlefield. They admit that Russia is making advances, but very incrementally, and they claim that Russia is losing hundreds, if not thousands, of Russian soldiers every couple of blocks that they advance. Uh, and this is this part of this myth that Russia has lost anywhere between 100,000 to 200,000 soldiers. And I'm calling it a myth because I've never seen them actually break these numbers down. I've never seen any sort of logical explanation as to how they're, they're losing as many or more soldiers than, than Ukraine is. Uh, but then also there are articles like this. This is Medusa. This is a US funded Russian opposition media outlet. This is dated February of this year, 2023. And it says Media Zona and BBC News uh, Russian publish further figures on Russian losses in Ukraine. It says Media Zona and BBC News Russian, together with a group of volunteers, have confirmed the deaths of 14,093 Russian servicemen killed in the Ukraine war before February 12. They arrived at this total using only public records and other open sources. And again, Alexander from the Duran, he has gone over this many times, and he talks about how they admit that the numbers probably higher, which may or may not be true. Uh, but even if it was higher, it comes nowhere close to this 100,000 to 200,000 figure that the Pentagon and the White House continuously cite. And when you crunch the numbers yourself, you realize this is about 1,000 Russian deaths per month, not 1,000 Russian deaths per block. So you have uh, Under Secretary of Defense for Policy Colin Kahl and Counselor to the Secretary of State Derek Chollette uh, again, just fleeing into the realm of delusion 
to try to sell what is going on in Ukraine as, as some sort of positive development for, for Ukraine and for their sponsors in Washington, London, and Brussels. They also, again, they talk about uh, calling up untrained conscripts in reference to the mobilization. We know that the mobilization was actually calling up reservists who already served in the Russian military, have, Rus uh, have military experience, maybe not necessarily in combat, but they, they are not untrained conscripts. So again, retreating into delusion. They talk about Russia throwing bodies at the problem, uh, this, this notion that Okay, or maybe Russia's making gains, but it's because they're using these human wave tactics. Demonstrably untrue. Then these, these two U.S. officials are, are asked about whether or not Russia can outlast the West in, in terms of military industrial outputs and, and in terms of fighting on the battlefields between Russian forces and these proxy Ukrainian forces. And the conversation went from this semi- technical, even if the numbers were all made up or, or completely fictitious, they were trying to be as technical as possible. When they came to this question, it became purely empty platitudes about resolve. And the problem is resolve does not churn out more uh, artillery shells that Ukraine needs on the battlefield. Industry does. And there is no way for the West to expand industry to meet Ukraine's needs. There is no way to do it. The West is struggling just to maintain Ukraine's rate of losing, uh, saying nothing of any possibility of them increasing military industrial output and the flow of weapons and ammunition to Ukraine to match Russian firepower, let alone outmatch it. Uh, then the whole conversation ends by talking about how important it is to succeed in Ukraine, because if they don't succeed in Ukraine, then countries like China they're going to have a, a blank check to do whatever they want. And what, they, what they're talking about is China reunifying Taiwan, which, by the way, is internationally recognized as part of China already. It is already considered part of China. And the, the only reason why there is this, this issue, this question over Taiwan, is because the United States is injecting itself into China's internal political affairs. They are flooding Taiwan with weapons, and they are also backing political factions that seek separatism from the rest of China. That is why that is a problem. And it, what, what they're basically saying is we, we are waging this proxy war against Russia with Ukraine. And if we, if we are not even successful disrupting and destroying, dividing and destroying Russia, how could we possibly imagine then moving on to China and repeating the whole process over again? They also talk about how not only are they capable of deterring and punishing Russia, but they're also capable of dictating terms to China over Taiwan. And I think the, the, the phrase they used was, we, we can walk and chew bubble gum at the same time. In, in, in other words, we can wage proxy wars against both Russia and China at the same time. And we can cripple and destroy and isolate both of them because this, this is what this is actually about. This is not about uh, authoritarianism versus Western democracy. This is about the West eliminating peer and near peer competitors. They, they want to control everything and they don't want anyone in the picture that could potentially push back and Russia and China are, are already pushing back, significantly so. Uh, they mention Hong Kong and they, they say, you know, the situation with Hong Kong is a warning about the potential fate of Taiwan. Again, remember that both Hong Kong and Taiwan are internationally recognized as parts of China. They talk about how China absorbed this so-called vibrant democracy. And I've gone over the situation in Hong Kong many times in the past. Uh, all this so-called vibrant democracy was, was US proxies. It was a, a nexus of US sedition uh, U.S. and U.K. sedition inside of China, and what China did was uproot it. That's what they did. They didn't e eliminate some sort of vibrant democracy. They uprooted U.S. meddling, and they plan on doing the exact same thing in Taiwan. Uh, the U.S. governments and the Western media might try to make it out as if Russia and China are the ones provoking conflict here or are acting aggressively, but in reality, they're reacting to the United States and NATO principally. They have gone from one nation to the other, uh, destroying them, invading them, bombing them, uh, 
turning them inside out. This is a process that if you just look on a map, you can see it was leading all the way up to both uh, Russia and China's borders. And now Russia and China are finally pushing back. This is a, a matter of self-defense and self-preservation for both Russia and China, and also for the rest of the developing and newly industrialized world. They are all targets of yeah, US hegemony, the, their desire to maintain it uh, at the cost of everyone else's sovereignty. We see how things are shifting. We see these two US officials, uh, a high level representative from the Department of Defense and a high level uh, representative of the State Department. They're acting as if Russia, uh, they're acting as if the United States is, is able to contain both Russia and China at the same time. But everything that they're talking about indicates weakness. Uh, uh, serious insecurity. The fact that the majority of what they were talking about is rooted in delusion and uh, fiction rather than reality. This, this should tell you everything you need to know about how dangerously desperate the U.S. has become. So uh, we have to keep an eye on what's going on on the battlefield right now in Ukraine, but it's really important to get into the mindset of U.S. policymakers because they are ultimately the ones making all of these bad decisions that we see eventually translate out on, onto the battlefields. Uh, I will be back to doing videos on um, my regular three video per week basis. Thank you for your patience. If you thought this video was useful, please like and share. Think about subscribing. It's free to do. It helps the channel grow. Uh, check the video description below for other places you can find and follow my work. I put uh, the links to everything that I reference in this video in the video description below. Also in the video description are ways you can help support my work. I do not monetize my YouTube channel. If you see an ad pop up, feel free to skip it because it's not, it's not doing me any good. If you do want to support my work, please do so through Buy Me A Coffee and also Patreon. The links to, to both of those uh, will be in the video description below. And to everyone who has been helping out, thank you so much, whether it's month to month or one-time donations, or even if you're just helping share my work, uh, it's all greatly appreciated. So thank you, and as always, thank you for watching.